Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It takes Zoom just a minute or so to add everybody into the room. So please sit tight and we'll get started in just a few moments. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Just giving Zoom a few more moments to add everybody into the room and then we will get started. Thanks so much for your patience. Okay, hopefully Zoom has had enough time to add everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on reproductive healthcare after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications. Reproductive healthcare overlaps with every other kind of healthcare. And in the multiple states where abortion bans are taking effect, doctors are now limited in the kind of care they can provide to pregnant patients. We have three Duke physicians with us this afternoon to discuss how the new legal environment complicates the treatment of illness and disease during pregnancy. With us this morning is Dr. Megan Close. She is a rheumatologist who treats patients who are pregnant or want to become pregnant and have a rheumatic disease. Also joining us is Dr. Beverly Gray. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist and founder of the Duke Reproductive Health Equity and Advocacy Mobilization Team. And we have Dr. Maria Small. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist and a specialist in maternal and fetal medicine. Good afternoon to you all. Dr. Close, uh, can you start by telling us a little bit about rheumatic disease in pregnancy and how bans on abortion make treating it more difficult? Absolutely. So uh, women with rheumatic disease, which is a, a large collection of autoimmune diseases in which the immune system is attacking a woman's own body, um, can have a lot of complications during pregnancy, particularly for women who have systemic lupus erythematosus, often called lupus, um, we see high rates of pregnancy loss, preterm birth, stillbirth, uh, preeclampsia, and severe health consequences, both short-term and long-term for both the mother and for the baby. So abortion bans really change the landscape of rheumatic disease care for women of reproductive age, not just the women who are pregnant or want to become pregnant, but really for all women of reproductive age because so many of our medications um, either can, we know, impact uh, pregnancy uh, with complications or might. So some of our most commonly used medications, bedrock rheumatology medications like methotrexate and mycophenolate are known to increase birth defects um, when there is first trimester exposure. And I'm particularly concerned that the use of these medications is going to decrease in women of reproductive age who are not trying to get pregnant leading to increased medical complications and disability, organ failure, and in some situations, premature death in these women. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we'll dig more into that in a moment, but Dr. Small, for now, I'd like to come to you. You specialize in, in hypertensive and cardiac diseases. So similar question, what kind of effects do bans on abortion have on being able to treat conditions in your area of expertise? Mm. I think one of the really sad aspects of um, this ban and definitely related to your question is we know in the United States that um, cardiac, cardiac disease is one of the leading, the leading cause of maternal death. And so many cardiac diseases can result in a much higher risk of death in pregnancy. So sometimes individuals who are pregnant with a cardiac condition are, um, need to have the option to um, terminate a pregnancy, to end a pregnancy as a life-saving um, action for themselves. Um, in general, we even know that the safety of abortion relative to um, carrying a pregnancy to term is, is something that's um, very important and people don't necessarily realize that there's a 14 times higher risk of carrying a pregnancy to, to term in general compared to a termination of pregnancy or an abortion. So this is just part of women's health care that care for pregnant individuals and postpartum individuals that people don't, don't seem to be taking into account in this banning of access to um, a very important um, part of reproductive care. 
Absolutely, thank you. Um, Dr. Gray, besides some of these diseases we've, we've just heard about, obviously there are, there are countless other complications that can arise during pregnancy. Can you talk a little bit about how abortion bans complicate treating some of the other issues that commonly arise? Absolutely. Um, so we see patients with a variety of different needs and concerns when they're reaching out to us for care. So um, you can imagine patients who receive a diagnosis of cancer when they're early and pregnant and they're accessing medical care and they find out um, that they have this new diagnosis. We see a lot of teenagers that fall into that category as well, who um, maybe don't have access to contraception or don't really understand their bodies and they find themselves facing an unplanned pregnancy. Um, there are a whole host of medical conditions that impact people of reproductive age. And I think, you know, until people have an understanding of what individuals are facing, it's really hard to, to comprehend. And so, you know, we've, we've said this before, you know, we all know or care for someone or love someone who's had an abortion. And I think we, um, when we're, when we're allowed sort of that window into people's lives and an understanding of what they're facing, um, we're able to appreciate how, how decisions are made, how, um, how folks are approaching their lives and their futures. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Gray. Thank you all three for those um, opening answers. We will open it up to questions now. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions in advance. You can also pose questions via the Q&A window at any time. If you would like to ask a question in person, please raise your hand in Zoom and we can unmute you when your turn comes around. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, start, start us off, we do have some um, previously submitted questions and several of the, the largest ones involve um, the idea of abortion bans with an exception when the, the life of the mother is in danger. And of course, there are so many issues related to that. And Dr. Close, I'd like to start with you um, because obviously, when a decision has to be made, has to be made that a, 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 a mother's life is potentially in danger. How does that complicate um, treating the the condition that has put the mother's life in danger at first? And what are the factors that that could? What are the effects of having to take the time to make that kind of a decision in the heat of the moment? Well, pregnancies that threaten the life of a woman with rheumatic disease. Um, are surprisingly common. So I probably see one or two women per year who conceive when their rheumatic disease is active in an ex to an extent that um, could lead to kidney damage or damage to another organ or um, could drive up her blood pressure dangerously high and put her at risk for a stroke or heart attack. Um, so we, we run into these cases more often than not. And often at the same time that the woman's health is in danger, the pregnancy itself and the developing fetus is also at very high risk for a very early delivery, sometimes before it is, is viable and can survive outside the womb. And sometimes in the first weeks um, of viability when it's going to require months in the intensive care nursery and likely if they make it out alive, um, have, have long-term permanent consequences. So we see these pregnancies here um, at all major institutions across the country every single year. Um, and these conversations with patients are really challenging because it's not like a woman can walk in very early in pregnancy and I can say, you for sure are gonna have a catastrophic outcome. Instead, it's a lot of, um, here's the situation, here are the risks. How do you wanna weigh the risks? Where do you personally draw the line of your safety, your ability to mother your existing children, your ability to survive this pregnancy versus your desire to continue this specific pregnancy, how they weigh this specific pregnancy that will likely end in catastrophe versus a potential future pregnancy that could be very well planned and lead to a very successful delivery. So there's a lot of nuance that physicians and patients really take very seriously. These are long conversations. These are hard conversations. These are conversations in which women Involve their spouse, involve their family, involve their 
um, priests and pastors and other people who really can help guide them through these really life-changing decisions. Um, so uh, different women pick different things, right? And uh, and I can't always predict ahead of time who is going to choose uh, which direction to head. Often I see women who are so hopeful that they can make this pregnancy survive and are so hopeful that they can become a mother this way that they will continue in what I know as a physician has a, a really low chance of success. Those are for me, the hardest pregnancies um, to watch and then to um, care for the women after they deliver and have um, you know, infants and then children who have devastating complications. It's really heartrending for me and um, taking away the ability of women to make that challenging decision for themselves, um, I find particularly tragic here. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Close. Dr. Small, you mentioned um, in your opening answer how heart disease is, is the, the highest cause of maternal morbidity. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, having to make a decision about whether a, a, mother's, a pregnant mother's life is in danger complicates the work um, that you're trying to do? Yes. I, I think one thing I did want to um, acknowledge is just how very thoughtful and very careful individuals in this situation of having to decide whether or not to continue a pregnancy in the setting of a maybe catastrophic physical um, condition to themselves that is being worsened by pregnancy. How thoughtful and, and how in, involved so many people are in that decision and working with that individual. So as Dr. Klaus just, Dr. Klaus just mentioned, Pediatricians are involved, maternal fetal medicine specialists are often involved, rheumatologists are often involved, and these folks are working with that individual to make a very difficult decision. And you contrast that to individuals who are making decisions about women's lives, and they don't know the very basics of reproductive anatomy. I think one of the cases we had recently was of a, of a congressperson who asked if you could swallow a camera and see if it ends up in the uterus. For us as healthcare providers and for our patients, this is a disservice because we need these conversations to be between pregnant individuals, individuals considering pregnancy and folks who can really understand and give very thoughtful and um, helpful information at a time that is critically, critically difficult for many pregnant individuals and their families. So I think you asked about maternal mortality um, and in terms of risk to um, individuals, if pregnancy occurs in the setting of a life-threatening condition and for the life of the mother, um, people need to be allowed the option to make those choices privately and in conjunction with, with carefully um, thoughtful people around them. So if there are other aspects I can answer, please follow up, give me a follow up question. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, uh, Dr. Small. We will certainly dig into that some more. Dr. Gray, I'd like to come back to you again. Because this whole idea of um, uh, a mother's life, a pregnant mother's life being in danger, um, people tend to think of it as, as, as a, uh, a black and white thing. Either somebody's life is in danger or they're not. But of course, there are long-term health risks that you as physicians have to weigh, even if somebody might not die on a table right in front of you. Can you talk a little bit about that and how the whole idea of exceptions for um, the risk to life of a mother isn't really a helpful binary distinction to make? This is a very challenging thing that many physicians right now are facing in states like Texas, where there are really strict bans. You know, they're having to determine at what point is someone's life so in danger that we can intervene and help save their lives. And there was a recent uh, research letter in the American Journal of OBGYN that talked about um, sort of this natural experiment that's happening in Texas right now. So you know, we take care of many cases where unfortunately patients break their water very early in pregnancy. And we know that that puts their lives at risk for infection, severe infection that can um, lead to ICU admission or even death, um, hemorrhage or bleeding. Um, 
and we we've known we know that those patients in those situations are at a grave danger. And with the, you know, the passing of the laws in Texas that put a very strict ban with a very narrow exception on saving the life of the patient, they saw a doubling of the morbidity of the patients who are experiencing that early breaking of water. And so essentially they were having to watch those patients until they were on the brink of you know, a catastrophic outcome, and then they could take care of them. And so it is a spectrum. It's not, you know, like one day you can give a patient a test that says, okay, you're sick enough that we can take care of you now. Um, and so that, that makes it complicated for physicians who are just trying to do the right thing, who are trying to give their patients the best advice and the best care, the best evidence-based care, and that's being limited. And many of these bans across the country, we're seeing that they seek to prosecute physicians that they want to scare physicians so that they're not taking care of patients in an evidence-based, safe way. And I think that's just corroding the trust that patients have with their physicians. There, there are states that are enacting laws that are forcing physicians to have certain conversations or not have certain conversations to not help patients seek the care that they want or need. And I think what's really disheartening is just how quickly these laws are changing, how fast it's moving, how quickly patients are being affected all over the country. Um, so, you know, your question was about how do we tell if someone's sick enough? And, you know, it's, it's really hard to say, um, you know, in each individual situation, what, what constitutes enough illness? Do you need one organ failing? Do you need two organs failing? Um, do you need to be to the point where you're bleeding, where you need a blood transfusion? What are, what are those questions? How do we ask this? That's not written into the law. So, so patients are confused. Phys physicians are confused. You know, ethicist lawyers are getting involved in care. And I think that's just clouding, clouding the issue and creating a situation where we're offering worse care for patients. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that, and um, just to, to clarify a point I think that you were just making, is it clear yet that a doctor's word is going to be considered sufficient um, that a patient's life is in danger before you act to terminate a pregnancy? I think that's a, a good question that a lot of people are asking. I mean, I think one, fortunately, right now, currently in North Carolina, we are still able to provide comprehensive reproductive health care, including abortion care through viability. And so we are worried that that may change in the future, but right now we're in the moment not having to answer those questions on a day-to-day -day basis. My colleagues in Texas, it's, it's very different. So they have a, a panel of expert physicians that determine um, when care can, provide it, care can be provided. Um, as someone who provides that care in our health system, Often those cases happen at two in the morning, you know, when, uh, you know, you need those experts, you're, you know, having to get folks up out of bed, wake them up and, and gain consensus rather than doing what's right for the patient in the moment. And I think for us, that's, that's just the really, you know, frustrating reality that I think, unfortunately, we'll be facing in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, a question now, I'll come back to you, Dr. Close, but we'd like to hear from all three of you on this um, uh, question that we've had is, what kind of concerns are you hearing from patients um, with Dr. Close and Dr. Small, particularly in the areas of, of disease that you specialize in, um, now that, you know, a, a bans in abortion are going in effect across the country and, and we have the possibility, I guess, of one here in North Carolina, what kind of concerns are you hearing from patients at the moment? Can I so I've been having some interesting conversations recently with patients. Um, I have certainly heard more interest from women recently about having tubal ligations um, instead of relying on things like um, the IUD um, or implant, things that we consider long-term reversible contraception so that a woman can change her mind in a few years and decide to get pregnant. Uh, I am hearing women who are afraid of having something um, bad happen to them during a pregnancy to the point that they're willing to sacrifice their desire for future children, even though they're not really entirely sure they don't want to have children. Um, we are beginning to have discussions with our patients who are on medications that cause major birth defects, in particular, our young patients with systemic lupus in their kidneys. We prescribe uh, mycophenolate for that primarily, 
Um, that is really the medication that all studies show is the best treatment for these patients and the best chance of having them avoid kidney failure and transplant and, and so on. Um, but we know that pregnancies that are conceived on that medication, one out of four live births will have a major birth defect. Um, and so we are um, changing our conversations already with these patients. We used to talk a lot about how they really needed to avoid pregnancy, we, but we gave them some leeway in how they did that, right? We, we trusted them to really make those decisions for themselves. And we are wrestling amongst ourselves as rheumatologists as to how much um, freedom do we give women in those situations to make their own reproductive health choices versus where do we need to step in and, and not allow them to get pregnant um, by using more uh, strongly effective contraception that might have different side effects, but the trade-off is we avoid these catastrophic pregnancies. This is not a comfortable position to be in. I don't think I should be making choices for other women about their reproductive health and their reproductive health capacity. Um, but that's the situation that we are in that um, I also know the catastrophe of people conceiving in those situations if abortion is not available to them. So um, it's really changing those conversations in a way that um, I think is uncomfortable to many providers. Um, and many rheumatologists just don't have the expertise to have these conversations well, which I think also puts many women at a disadvantage. Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Small, can you talk about concerns you're hearing from your patients? Well, I do high-risk obstetrics, which means I also do prenatal diagnosis. And with prenatal diagnosis, by ultrasound, we look at the developing fetus. Um, many people think of ultrasound as just looking at the face and some of the, um, the pictures that we may take home with us, but we also look for major birth defects. The time that we do these ultrasounds is usually around 18 weeks of pregnancy because that's when we are more likely to see all of the organs forming and developing accurately and be able to see if there are birth defects. So for many of our, our patients there, um, or at least my patients, are asking if something is seen, how long do I have before I have to make a decision or how, how soon do I have to make a decision if there's something major that is wrong with my baby and I may not want my baby to live with a major birth defect and a severely compromised quality of life. These are decisions that individuals make um, on a regular basis and when they have a change in guidelines where those decisions may need to be made earlier, it becomes more challenging and it becomes more painful because no one can say for sure what they would do in the circumstance that many people are put in because you don't know often what you would do. You think you know what you might do, but often you don't know what you may do. And so having those um, options, the option of um, ending a pregnancy needs to be available to individuals who need it. Now, one more point I wanted to make about the maternal mortality issue. Right now we are in a maternal health crisis in the United States. We already are dealing with trying to um, help providers and patients know the warning signs for um, pregnancy-related conditions that need to be acted upon. So you have conditions where legislators are determining when you can and can't act upon conditions in pregnancy. And these people, should, this is not their role. And many of them have shown us over and over again by their statements that they have no clue about pregnancy and women's health. And it really is, is sad and disturbing that we are fighting so hard to decrease maternal mortality rates. And yet we have conditions where people are now wondering, well, can I intervene in this condition that usually is associated with maternal death, like an ectopic pregnancy, but there's a heartbeat in the tube, so I can't do what I know is the right surgery to do because a legislator has said you can't remove a pregnancy that has a heartbeat, but some of these same individuals erroneously think you can remove that pregnancy and put it inside the uterus. That just can't happen. And a woman's, that is the number one cause of first trimester 
death in pregnancy. So we can't play with this these conditions, but um, it seems that that is is what's happening. Thank you, Dr. Saul. I appreciate your willingness to express the exasperation that uh, I think is very widespread at this moment. Dr. Gray, I'd like to hear from you also on some of the feedback that you've been getting from patients in these last few months. So we're seeing many patients who are seeking um, alternate forms of contraception, more effective forms of contraception. Um, we know that IUDs and implants are as effective as tubal ligation, but I would say we are seeing patients at record numbers who are seeking tubal ligation. So they're seeking a surgery with associated complications and risk to protect themselves from pregnancy. Um, and so that's one thing that we're seeing. We're also seeing you know, patients who are coming from out of state, from, from Georgia, from South Carolina, from Florida, where bans are already in place. They're looking for care wherever they can get it right now. And so I think, um, our clinic is, is busy, Planned Parenthood's clinics are very busy and overwhelmed. And I think um, right now in this moment, we're, we're just struggling to provide the best care possible and care for the patients who need us. I think the other downstream effects that, you know, I don't think, I don't think we're prepared for is nationally is an increase in birth rates. Um, we already see rural hospitals closing um, their obstetric units. And now, you know, at Duke, we're seeing more and more deliveries every year. And so I think um, that's another thing that, you know, as, as medical um, providers across the country, we need to start thinking about how we're going to prepare for more pregnancies. And we've already seen predictions that maternal mortality will increase in states where it's already high. Um, many of those states that have high maternal mortality rates also have very strict abortion bans. And so I think, I think we need to be prepared uh, for the future of obstetrics in our country. Thank you all um, for that. And uh, there are some things I want to follow up on there. But before we move on, Dr. Gray, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this um, concept of late term abortion, because it seems to be a phrase that gets used, as Dr. Smaller said, lots of legislators without medical backgrounds throwing around terms that they think are medical and maybe aren't. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and, and what it actually means in a medical sense, if anything? So a late term abortion is not a medical term. It's not a term that we as physicians use. It's a term that's very politicized that politicians use um, to make, um, make it appear that the vast majority of abortions are happening in the late second, third trimester, which is absolutely not the case. We know that the vast majority of abortion care that occurs in our country happens in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. And only 1.2% of care happens after 20 weeks. And that's typically before viability. So it's right around the 20th week. Um, and in North Carolina, that rate is even lower. And so I think those are the cases that, that politicians wanna talk about, that wanna make it seem like there's this care that's happening right um, at term pregnancy, but, but that's not the case. We take care of very, sick, medically complicated patients all the time here at our institution. And many of those patients want, like Dr. Klaus and Dr. Small talked about, they want to continue their pregnancies and they want to have hope for those pregnancies. And we give them that hope. We give them the best care so that they can continue those pregnancies. And so if patients um, are past viability, but still have a very medically complex course, we care for them. And if and, and those patients, they don't have a late-term abortion. They have a delivery. They have a C-section. They have a vaginal delivery. We care for those patients. We care for their families. We care for their children. And so I think throwing around that term is, you know, um, is, is kind of dangerous. And I think politicians are trying to be doctors and using non-medical language to kind of make it seem like something nefarious is happening, which is not the case. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Dr. Close, coming back to you, and, and as always, I'd love to hear uh, the perspective of all of our panelists on this. One of the expected effects of um, bans on the clinical abortions is to see an increase of abortion by male, people using abortion pills, maybe without 
um, being administered by a, a physician or without having the care of a physician. Given that all three of you deal with high risk pregnancies, are you concerned that um, women who uh, pursue this option are gonna be putting themselves at greater risk? That's a great question. I think it's uh, it's one that rheumatologists have not been grappling with, I would say. Um, but I think it's I think it's an excellent point. I think that you know pregnancy can be really high risk for women with rheumatic disease, particularly in that it can increase blood clots, um, it can increase uh, rheumatic disease activity. Many patients, when they find out they're pregnant, stop their medications that they need to control their disease and and are at risk for flares. Um, and so women who terminate, um, do medical terminations at home um, and or don't, uh, don't let their doctor know. So particularly in states where this might be illegal, I think that women are not going to be forthcoming with their providers. We will not really understand their risk landscape when they are calling. And you know, we're not gonna know why they're having a flare. We're not gonna understand why they're having blood clots. And I think really importantly, we're not gonna know how to help them have a successful pregnancy in the future. So I do think that that's risky and problematic, particularly for a rheumatologist not to be aware that women are pregnant um, could really lead to some really lasting consequences for these patients. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and Dr. Small, I'm, I'm curious in your, uh, your take on this uh, as well. My take is a little similar, but a bit different. I've, um, I also do as, as Dr. Gray Global Health, and I've worked in settings where um, abortion is illegal, except in the cases of um, risk to the maternal um, life. And in those settings, it's not, it was not uncommon for individuals to take medication or use ingestions in order to end a pregnancy and present to the hospital with clinical symptoms that were um, very dangerous, either with sepsis, life-threatening infection, or also reach um, conditions where they maybe didn't have a pregnancy in the uterus, but a pregnancy that was in the tubes, and they um, did not come to the hospital or didn't see a um, care provider because of fear, um, and there and tried to um, end the pregnancy. Um, using um, other means. So I think when you are creating a situation where there is a barrier between healthcare providers and patients, it is only exacerbating the same mechanisms associated with increases in maternal mortality in the United States. I'll pass, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, Dr. Gray, I wonder if, if you have anything to, uh, to add to that. So I think, you know, we're lucky to live in a time where we have access to medication abortion. And, you know, through COVID, we, um, a lot of clinics were pivoting their care to offering telehealth and offering medication abortion through telehealth. And there's a lot of data to suggest that that's actually very safe. Um, and most patients can, you know, answer a set of questions and determine whether or not um, they have a pregnancy that's in their uterus, how far along they are. And, um, access to, to telehealth for patients during the pandemic was, you know, was an option for them to still seek um, abortion care. Um, we're lucky that we have medication abortion, which is different than 40 years ago, pre-Roe, um, when we saw that patients would take, take their health care into their own hands, and there were not safe ways for them to manage their own um, abortions. And we saw very high death rates related to um, to abortion. Once abortion was legalized, we saw those death rates drop drastically. Um, and I don't know, you know, with a medication, abortion is very safe. Folks can take those medications at home and the process, um, you know, can be guided by, uh, ideally guided by a physician and under care so that if a patient has questions, they can reach out. If they have complications, they can reach out. I think the other thing that people are thinking a lot about is how, um, how patients who are, who are taking care into their own hands, how they might be criminalized, um, either through the medical system or um, through policing of, of, of women's bodies, of 
you know, there are cases of patients who've had miscarriages and have faced criminal charges. Um, and so there's a lot of worry and concern that patients won't necessarily speak up if they are having a complication because they're afraid that they'll go to jail. Um, and so these are, you know, these are a lot of problems that I didn't learn about as an OBGYN going through medical school and residency. Now we're having to, to face, how do we care for patients? How do we help them navigate a system um, where they feel scared um, and where they might not have access to the care that they need and the care that they deserve? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Close, coming back, Back to you. We've had a, a question here about, you know, the, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about the, the legal risk to doctors just um, providing reproductive health care uh, in when when there are abortion bans. But are there any concerns about the opposite, that in some way you could be at risk of not providing enough care to a pregnant woman because out of fear of, of violating uh, a law against abortion? Is that something that physicians are concerned about? I think physicians are concerned about that. I mean, I think physicians, you know, we go into becoming doctors in order to help our patients live the best lives that they can. And I think that sometimes that means um, talking about abortion and helping patients access abortion. And, um, uh, and I think that doctors are concerned that they're not going to have the ability to do that for their patients and that that could lead to legal consequences for them. Um, I think there's a lot of talk in the other direction, but I think it's important that we remember that when we provide substandard care to our patients, um, we do them a disservice and that that puts all of us um, at some risk. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Close. Dr. Small, um, you mentioned uh, again about um, cardiac disease um, uh, being one of the, the number one um, fatality causing illnesses in pregnant women. Sorry, stumbled over my words there. Well, um, that's also something that we know disproportionately affects communities of color. And there are all, there's already a massive gap in reproductive health equity um, in this country. How are you concerned about, um, how concerned are you that abortion bans will play into that and, and kind of further the gaps that we're already seeing um, in racial inequity in healthcare in this country? So I, I think we've heard several of the um, concerns. And I think as you pointed out cardiac disease is the leading cause of um, maternal mortality in the United States. And a lot of the drivers of those increased risk are associated with racism and, um, and social drivers of health, like where people live, work, um, access to care. And one of the things I'll just maybe highlight one aspect that is also an important um, association with um, the ban on abortion, criminalization of, of um, these um, access to, to abortion care and the association with um, racial inequities in maternal mortality. And I think Dr. Gray mentioned it, and that is that whole idea that people being afraid that they may be criminalized if they're seeking out abortion care, even if they're seeking out um, support related to how to self-manage a termination. And so you have a scenario where people who may, because of previous injustices in the healthcare system or previous mistrust of the healthcare system are contributing to some of the um, maternal mortality in the United States, some of it. And you have a scenario where you've placed individuals in an adversarial position that may even involve law enforcement. And I think that is a very dangerous situation for communities of color. And I think this environment of placing pregnant and potentially pregnant individuals um, in this kind of toxic relationship with healthcare providers is one that is only going to worsen maternal mortality and certainly worsen the disparities in maternal mortality and equities in maternal mortality for Black women in America. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Small. Um, Dr. Gray, staying on this um, difficult subject of, of criminalizing uh, the work that physicians have to do with pregnant women, can you talk a little bit about how the care for women who miscarry um, overlaps with mm -hmm. abortion care and, and how um, an abortion ban complicates your ability to care for um, a woman who has a miscarriage? 
So the medications that we use for miscarriage management are absolutely the same as the ones that we use for medication abortion care. Um, and so the, the process of, of someone's body having a miscarriage versus going through the, the normal process of a medication abortion, there's, there's no litmus test that you can say, oh, this patient had a miscarriage or not. And I think that worries patients in that they, you know, wonder, will, you know, will doctors know what's going on with my body? Will they test me for these medications? And it doesn't even matter because those are the same medications that we use for, for miscarriage. Um, and so that, you know, the procedures are the same, you know, we've talked about, um, about this topic before about how, you know, if we limit, um, exposure to the care to patients that also limits our ability to train the next generation of physicians and providing the same care, the same procedures. And will we be training a generation of physicians that will be less skilled? And I, I think if we had a ban here in our state, our physicians would be less skilled in providing the care that they need to care for patients seeking abortion care and patients seeking miscarriage care. Um, you know, that I saw that there was a, a question in the chat as well about mental health and how, um, how these bans might have impacts on mental health. I think there are a couple of studies that highlight that abortion and access to abortion care does not have long-term impacts on mental health. And in fact, for patients who are turned away from abortion care. So if we look at the turnaway study, which is a long-term study out of UCSF, looking at the impacts on, on patients who were denied abortion care, um, they were more likely to have struggles with mental health. They were more likely to be tethered to a relationship with a, with a violent partner. Um, they were more likely to live in poverty. And so we know that um, turning patients away from care has impacts um, on all aspects of a person's life and health and um, vitality. And so I think um, there, are, there are a lot of potential impacts and specifically with mental health, I think, you know, it's um, our mental health providers are very taxed right now. Um, it's very challenging to get patients the appointments that they need. Um, a lot of health insurance doesn't fully cover mental health coverage. So there, you know, there are all these, all these disparities and who has access to certain types of care, whose lives will be impacted long-term. It's, it's just a, you know, it's a horrible domino effect of all of these impacts on people's, people's daily lives. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up here shortly, but I want to get some more comments uh, from our panelists before we go. Dr. Close, you mentioned in your opening about methotrexate, which is one of the treatments for rheumatic disease in pregnant women that can cause pregnancy loss. Can you talk about some of the, the difficult questions that you have to face in, in prescribing that medication now when causing a pregnancy loss could potentially be, uh, I guess, an illegal thing to do? Yeah, it's a great question. So methotrexate is really a foundational drug for uh, rheumatic disease. It is really our most commonly used immunosuppressant for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, almost all insurance companies require that a woman receive methotrexate before she gets any further uh, medical options to treat rheumatoid arthritis. She needs to take it and either do well with it, which many people do, or fail it before she can move on. Um, it's also um, really amongst our least expensive medications. So a year of methotrexate costs somewhere less than $1,000. Um, a year of all of the medications that come after that costs somewhere around $100,000. So there's a huge difference in price. And um, so methotrexate is a foundational medicine. It's not something that we can just or should just withhold from women of reproductive age. Um, but it does bring a uh, risk of pregnancy loss and it done, does bring a risk of birth defects. About seven to 10% of live born infants will have a major birth defect after exposure to methotrexate. Also sort of an interesting twist is that methotrexate at, much, at doses much higher than what we prescribe for rheumatic disease is actually one of the treatments for ectopic pregnancy. Um, and so there have been uh, reports in the news about women who have been unable to access their usual methotrexate prescriptions um, because of concerns that it could be misconstrued to be used um, for an illegal abortion. 
Um, I'm concerned that patients who have a prescription for methotrexate, whether they're taking it or not during their pregnancy, who suffer a pregnancy loss could be accused of trying to terminate their own pregnancy and really end up in a legal quandary with that in which it is um, they can't prove anything because methotrexate actually that goes out of your bloodstream almost within 24 hours. So nobody can check a blood level. It's just going to be, you know, her word is going to be what is going to be necessary. And I'm worried that physicians will be hesitant about prescribing it. You know, in some of the laws, it says if the, if the doctor intended it for something other than a pregnancy termination, meaning if the doctor intended for its prescription to be for rheumatoid arthritis, then they're exempt from any kind of um, legal consequences. But that's, I suspect, going to have to be litigated in court in some situations. And I think that some rheumatologists just aren't want to going to want to go through that um, kind of pain for themselves or their families. So um, I'm really worried about the status of methotrexate in the long run. I think it's a bedrock medication and all of our patients should have access to it. And I'm worried that some of our patients won't have access. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, before we wrap up, Dr. Small, I'd like to come back to you for some closing thoughts on and how um, you know the, the, the current legal landscape is affecting the way that you talk to patients, affecting the, what, what's your biggest concern in terms of, uh, I guess, the, the, able, the, the kind of medical care that you're able to provide to your patients? Is this, your, what's your, it sounds ridiculous to say your biggest concern because obviously this is oh, an enormous issue, but. I'm gonna take one of the questions in the chat that I think Dr. Gray addressed and that's um, mental health. And I think this is a, an area that um, is during, garnering appropriately additional attention in our country. And um, both taking the topic of mental health and delaying intervention for pregnancies like what Dr. Gray described, an individual who may um, have a premature rupture of membranes, for example, um, and the recent study that, that um, was highlighted in one of our medical journals showed that individuals who had what is often um, an elected appropriate intervention at the time um, when medically recommended, um, when, when there was a, a delivery or, or ending of the pregnancy um, below 22 weeks, which is below viability, had a 57% um, or 33% risk of severe maternal morbidity compared to 57% risk of severe maternal morbidity when they had to wait for some critical vital or something that was life-threatening in the mother. And so severe maternal morbidity is associated with a higher risk for maternal conditions like depression and even post-traumatic stress disorder, because these are things that are life-threatening that don't cause death, but they would cause death if they did not get treated. So you're asking individuals to be put to the brink of death, but not having a, that outcome because a legislator has deemed that to be the case. And I don't think um, that is something that really um, concerns me. It troubles me. And in addition to the access barriers that are um, put in place by this type of legislation, just what we are going to do to um, worsen the um, overall health of, of mothers and pregnant individuals in this country. I think we just have no, no sense of just how, how bad this is going to impact um, individuals in our country. Thank you, Dr. Small. And before we close, Dr. Gray, I'd just like you to say a little bit more about what you think the abortion bans going across the country right now mean for the future of obstetrics care in this country and the women that need it. I mean, I think in states like, like Texas and others that have already had a strict ban in place, they're seeing how, how those changes are happening right before their eyes. They're seeing patients' lives put at risk on a daily basis. They're having to give patients non-evidence-based advice and recommendations because their state legislators are saying that that's the right thing to do. Um, like I said before, you know, you don't know 
what a patient's experiencing, what they're going through. You can't imagine it until you're facing it yourself. And I think, um, I think that trust between a patient and their physician or their healthcare provider needs to be reinstated. And I think having bands, there's this idea that a band will make care safer for patients, but that's absolutely not true at all. In fact, it makes care less safe. It will likely increase maternal mortality in our country where we already have a maternal mortality crisis. Um, and it's not just a simple question of, of right or wrong. This is, this is a complicated issue and people feel differently about it, but I think we have to let patients have autonomy over their lives so that they can make the best decisions for their lives so that they can treat their lupus, so they can live happy, fulfilling lives um, and be as healthy as possible and creating more barriers to care um, is impacting patients on a daily basis. And we're seeing that. I think, you know, we won't know, you know, the future of obstetrics, but I, you know, am worried that there will be an increase in maternal mortality. I worry that patients are going to have to travel further for care. Um, you know, I think I worry about, you know, as a residency director, I worry about the next generation of physicians that we're training. And will someone who trains in Texas have a different skill level than someone who trains in North Carolina? I think that's probably the case. And so I, I think there are so many downstream ramifications that we've only started to see the tip of the iceberg. Um, and over these next decades, um, if if we don't protect reproductive health in our country, um, the crisis is going to continue to worsen. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Gray. I think uh, we will call it there. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks to our panelists, Dr. Megan Close, Dr. Beverly Gray and Dr. Maria Small for sharing your expertise and opinions with us today. We'll be hosting more briefings on reproductive rights, including on the politics of the issue as the midterm elections get closer. Next week, though, we'll be talking about hurricanes, which feels like a metaphor, but in this case is literal. If you would like to be notified about those and up upcoming briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu or like and subscribe on Twitter. In the meantime, please stay well and be kind always. <laughs>